Hello, Facebook. We're running a little bit late this morning. I apologize. We're running a little bit tardy. I just didn't want to human today. I was having a little bit of trouble putting on my human suit, and uh, I have gotten a little bit chubby, so I I have to continuously be putting these pants on that don't fit, and then putting them back on the top shelf, and then Kate takes them to get dry clean. They end up back in my my in the back of the shuffle, and then what ends up happening is. I once again am in a situation where I'm like, holy smokes, my pants don't fit again. So anyway, uh, anyway, that's okay. I'm not trying to be skinny. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to be, be skinny. I'm here trying to embrace myself here. So we're going to have some fun today. Uh, Kate, jeez, uh, Leslie already logged in. Leslie, I'd planned on just doing the whole thing without you. <laughs> so you're booted. I'm kicking you off. No, I'm just kidding. All right, so um, give me just a moment. I'll go ahead and I'll get Leslie added to the broadcast. Uh, this is week six. This is week six. This is, uh, we're going to talk about transaction coordination. Um, and a lot of what we touched on last week uh, during the high school course was, uh, we talked about hiring and DISC. We talked about Myers-Briggs, a little bit about honoring your design, and of course, transaction coordination. So I was going to, there's going to be a one point or another where I'm just going to hijack the platform entirely, Leslie, um, and I'm going to flip on the disc class. Um, but in the meantime, let's go ahead and let's bring on our special guest, uh, Leslie Hill. Leslie, let's see here. Add right. Oh, not instructional material. That's not today, Serpa. Special guest is today. Um, hello, my friend. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing good. I just flew across the desert to get home. <laughs> that, that's some dedication. Yep. <laughs> well, I appreciate you you making it work. Um, I like I said, I had prepared on a prepared for you not to be here, so I just uh, made some adjustments to the class. So I'm going to go ahead and bring everything up here. Um, so everyone, this is Leslie Hill. Uh, she and I have worked together for years, um, okay. probably six or seven years. And uh, she's a transaction coordinator um, and a very talented, very awesome human being. And we are just about complete um, opposites when it comes to our disc and, uh, yeah. and whatnot, which Kate and I are also opposites. So we're going to get a little bit into that. But uh, so, Leslie, would you mind introducing yourself and tell, uh, telling everyone um, what it is a transaction coordinator does? Sure. Uh, so Leslie Hill, I've been uh, licensed a little over 20 years. Um, I started out in an admin transaction coordinator role and uh, went ahead and, and did some selling and some listing and uh, did that and just found that I was uh, happier and more true to my personality in a admin or transaction coordinator role which is kind of back office. Um, my detail to paperwork is um, pretty good. I've, I've been a compliance manager at several large companies. Um, you know, things that uh, I spot things that other agents don't spot when it comes to the, to the details of the paperwork. Um, and I'm good at the organization and keeping it all done. I know a lot of agents, you know, they get over three transactions and they're overwhelmed in paperwork. I sometimes have 75 and I'm okay. I might be pulling my hair out and work until midnight, but I'm okay. <laughs> the, uh, the Zoom class is laughing here. Amy's laughing. 75 transactions seems crazy. But at one point we were doing a lot of monthly transactions just on the homes team just on the David Serpa team. And, um, and we were part of a crew where there was actually, there was nine of us at one point that was making, made over a hundred thousand dollars. You were one of them as our uh, head transaction coordinator. And so what we did was we sort of, uh, we all just played our parts. We honored our design. And so instead of all of us trying to wear all of the hats, um, we decided, you know, some of us are going to be best as admins. Some of us are going to be best uh, working with buyers. We've got that warm personality over a long per period of time. Some of us are best with listings. Um, and so what we did was we really developed that squad, that company type structure that you find in the Marine Corps. And we had created a very um, family type environment. And uh, so 
Um, just like you said, 75 transactions. I had seven going in my second month in real estate. My first hire was a transaction coordinator because I had no interest whatsoever in the paperwork. Right. <laughs> so how do you keep 75 transactions going at a time? I've, over the years, developed systems that I use, and um, I'm a big proponent of collaboration, and I don't know everything. I never will. And other people, um, you know, sometimes there's brand new transaction coordinators in the business, but they're young, and they've got the, they've got a different view on things, and I've always been able to... Uh, you talk to people and you know, hey, how are you doing this? And they may tell me 10 different things, but only one of them interests me and I'll incorporate that into mine. Uh, you know, so I'm, I'm big on collaboration and uh, part of some TC groups. It's just, uh, it's good. And it, it's all about organization and details when it comes to the paper. Yeah, and I, I think that a big part of that, uh, just like you said, it's collaboration, it's systems. One of the beautiful things about real estate um, in that we were able to cultivate in, in our valley and still you know, we keep it going. There's a lot of really great agents out there that are collaborating cross brokerages. Um, when you get to that sort of mindset where you're like, I'm going to be better when I can expose myself to higher thought. Um, I'm going to be better as a part of a team versus out here trying to push the boulder up the hill by myself. And I knew immediately, inherently, just by my design, that I was not somebody that is designed to do paperwork. And so uh, that was not something that I wanted to do. And you and I had a conversation at one point where you were transacting, and you continue to transact. You do your friends and your family and whatnot. But uh, we were talking and we said, what do you like doing, Leslie? Like, where are you happy? And, uh, and it was a part of a really exciting part of I think everyone's career at that point of the team, because everyone was like, well, where do I belong? Where do I fit? How can I help the team? And so when you, uh, what was it, what was the decision? Excuse me. I'm sort of getting off into the woods here. What are some of the systems that you have developed that you can share with us? So I keep everything on a spreadsheet um, that has all the details of a file. Every file is different. Um, you know, we have our standard timelines for our inspection contingencies to be removed, our uh, appraisal and loan. But each transaction might be a little different. Maybe we've lowered the inspection contingencies to 10 days on one file um, or, you know, any of those. I, I have a spreadsheet that has all the details. Uh, for me, I need to know whose file it is. Is it David Serpa's file? <laughs> is it an EXP David Serpa file? Is it a Allison James file? Because that tells me different brokers require different documentation. And um, of course, the close of escrow, the contingency periods, um, whether or not we need a termite inspection or a termite clearance or a septic inspection, all these details are good to know, and I've got it all listed on a spreadsheet that I can then um, just pull out, you know, pull up on my computer. And I have to have at least two monitors. Um, a third would be nice if I could fit it on my desk, <laughs> um, you know, because I've got lots of windows open at any given time. But uh, I think keeping everything in a in uh, files, like I, I see some realtors and they just put, they save a document and they just put it any old place. Well, then they can't find the document. I've got realtors that literally call me up a day after we've opened escrow and they're like, I can't find the paperwork because they didn't put it into correct folders named so they could find them. Um, that's it. And and just learning over the years uh, what needs to be done on each transaction. Now, we talked about during the high school course uh, that you have sort of like a, a one sheet where like you keep everything and, um, and it, it goes line by line. And you showed everyone sort of like your back end and how that's organized. What I loved about it is that it's very similar to how almost um, old school and whatnot and that I am because... I roll around with binders in my uh, – we talked about how people sort of like made fun of me about my binders and whatnot. 
But what it does is it gives me an opportunity to stay very organized. I know when it is that I talk to the last client, what it is that I have to do today. And it's really, it's that hard cover back, back up that, you know, having it out in print that really makes it feel real for me. Yes. And, uh, one of my, um, sheets that I have, and I, I'll hold it up here to see if you can see it. Um, it, well, there it is. So it literally has everything I need to know at a glance regarding a file and from the escrow company, the escrow number, whether or not we need the termite, uh, it's got the other agents and transaction coordinators info on it. Um, it, I'm 52 and I've been doing this for 20 something years. So while I am good with the, uh, technology and, you know, the broker uploads and certain stuff like this, I'm also being a little older. I need to be able to see what I'm looking at because I have a lot of newer transaction agents and they're like, what do you mean you print that out and have a paper in front of you? It's like unheard of to them keep it all on the digital. And, and I tell them, I say, well, I do, I have it all on the digital, but when I'm working on multiple, multiple files and I'm switching within 15 minutes, I can have seven different files on my desk and I'm doing this on that one and this on that one. Well, I'll confuse them. If I don't have this in front of me, if I'm working on uh, Long's Peak, you know, six, seven, eight, nine Long's Peak, I've got that file in front of me, so I know what I'm doing. And it's a I great little cheat sheet. Cheat sheet. That's, that's exactly what. So, um, a couple of things that I wanted to, to hit on. First off, I'm going to get to in just a moment. I want to ask you what it is that a transaction coordinator does and does not do, because uh, I think that that's an important thing to talk about. Um, now, of course, you are a licensed real estate agent, and one of the things that I love about the way that you conduct your business is that you very much embrace the fact you're like, I'm a grandma, I ride Harley Davidsons, um, and I love to work behind my computer for you know, 10, 12 hours a day at least, and you're there, and you're available to, to the clients. And so one of the cool things, and I've been up there to your house a few times, I've seen the back end of, uh, of the, your, the Starship Enterprises, and um, it really, it's very high tech, but there are still some things that are, uh, that like your cheat sheet, that make it so that everything is very manageable. So can you tell everyone what a transaction coordinator does not do? Yeah, so again, it depends on if they're licensed or unlicensed. Um, just like, uh, you know, there's certain things a realtor can't do. Um, as a transaction coordinator, basically we collect all the paperwork, we keep track of the timelines and make sure that those timelines are being met. Um, we upload the paperwork to the, uh, when, once it's fully executed to the broker portal, if they have a portal, um, and turn in, make sure all that's done. Um, so we aren't, most transaction coordinators do not do addendums or repair requests. Now, I, I do, um, with the agent's uh, direction. So an agent will call me and say, hey, I need an addendum stating that we've changed the sales price to this, you know, or whatever the addendum is, and we'll go over it, and I will make up that addendum, shoot a screenshot to them, make sure it's exactly what's needed, and then send that out to be signed and send it over to the other side, to the uh, other agent involved. And not wow. only do you fill out these addendums and whatnot, um, you've actually saved me a couple of times or like helped me reword things. And uh, it got to a point to where it's like, I don't even want to write contracts anymore, Leslie. I think I just want you to help me out all the time. <laughs> and so Kate, of course, uh, um, is an ISFJ. And we're going to talk about the different Myers-Briggs types here on the back end of the class, as well as the different disc types in hiring. Um, but when would you suggest to somebody uh, that they add a transaction coordinator to their business? Right away, day one. 
and a uh, story I told in your last class that kind of um, does this. I, I'm anybody can miss anything. Um, but so a lot of my newer agents, I do help. I end up training a little bit and I've got one girl that is great and she learns quick. She never makes the same mistake twice. Um, but she likes to get out on her own by herself. And unfortunately it, it bit her, um, in her third transaction happened to be a mobile home on land out in Anza, I think, or Menifee somewhere. And, um, she did it all herself and she was so proud of herself. And, uh, but what she didn't notice that was on one of the pages, the buyer's agent had wrote that the seller was to install a 433 foundation. And she never addressed that. She had the seller sign it. We entered escrow and, you know, day two or three, I said, well, hey, who's going to be doing the 433 foundation? And she says, well, what's that? And I said, well, it's the thing your seller agreed to install per the contract. <laughs> and um, she says, well, I don't know what it is. What does it cost? And I said, well, it's $6,000 on the low end, $8,000 to $8,000. It's basically a, a foundation on a mobile home to make it a permanent foundation. And um, the seller wasn't too happy because that was not an expense they were expecting to pay. Um, but there was no way out of it because you know what? They had already contractually agreed to it and that could have blown up into a big, um, situation. Yeah. And and we, sorry. Yeah. We ended up getting it covered, uh, you know, and, and it smoothed out, but I had let her know before, whenever you want, even on a weekend, you call me and say, Hey, I wrote an offer shoot it over to me. I'll bring it up on my phone if I have to. I'll look it over real quick and and we'll verbally go over it. Take me five minutes and then send it out. Um, you know, and I do that for a lot of my agents. And you know what? Some of my seasoned agents can make mistakes. So putting a second set of eyes on something to tighten it up and and make it the best and protect your client that's only a plus and, and your, your transaction, transaction coordinator can do that. I want to get into the cost of a transaction coordinator in just a moment, but I would like to go ahead and uh, just for the sake of uh, everybody here in the Zoom class and everybody on Facebook uh, that does not know what a 433 is. Um, so a 433 is a permanent foundation. So um, you'll have a lot of uh, VA, FHA buyers, conventional buyers that want to buy a mobile home and have it on land. Um, and so there, there's a lot of mobile homes out there that you'll see that are just sitting on not even a concrete slab, but they're just sort of like blocked off and stacked up on different things or whatnot. That does not uh, qualify for uh, VA financing or FHA financing. Um, so what needs to happen is the house needs to be put on a permanent foundation. Now, there are all sorts of creative ways that you can go about this, like what the buyer's agent did, uh, you know, seller to pay for, uh, you know, the home to be put on a permanent foundation. And of course, that's perfectly legal. There's a uh, different sort of funding options that you could put into uh, play so that you can consider some of these homes that are not necessarily on a permanent foundation, but have the ability to be put on a permanent foundation. But uh, Leslie said something really important. She said a couple of things that were really important. She said, uh, one, she said, this agent doesn't often make the same mistake twice, which is great. And that's very commendable, but it only takes once. It only takes once. And then that ends up being a situation that could potentially cost your clients a lot of money. And so getting that second set of eyes is extraordinarily important. The second thing is that, uh, um, and I just forgot, um, geez, your bull in a china shop. Um, sorry, Amy's just stampeding around, throwing her breakfast around, knocking lights over. Um, so uh, um, Anyway, I completely forgot what I was saying. But anyway, get that second side of, set of eyes on it. My first hire, I was at a newer, or I was at a brokerage, which will go unnamed, but I uh, often call them the puppy mill of the industry. Uh, they no longer exist currently. But what happened was I got, um, I became licensed. They wanted me to take this eight week course before I started holding open houses. I'm like, is that re required? Because I've got kids to feed. I've got to get paid. Um, and they said, no, it's just 
uh, encouraged or strongly encouraged. I said, well, then I'm going to go out and start opening some escrows. And I opened seven escrows, um, and I found out what a transaction coordinator was. And I was like, you'll handle my paperwork for me? If I open an escrow and I talk to somebody and I find them the house, you'll do all of my paperwork. And my first TC was Rachel Webster, and she was laughing. She thought it was hilarious. She was like, yes, I will do your paperwork for you. Don't worry about it. I was like, are you serious? For how much? And it was just like, and it's like, and I'm telling you, it's a minimal amount of the transaction. And not only is it minimal, but there's safety put into it when you work with somebody like Leslie, um, in that Leslie doesn't get paid if you don't get paid. So Leslie, how much is it to hire uh, you specifically as a transaction coordinator? Me? I charge 500 at the close of a file. If we double end that, um, being a thousand, it's 800. And um, that means if we represent both sides, so buyer and seller. And um, again, I, I answer my phone all weekend long. Um, this weekend I had owing houses and one of his buyers wanted to make an offer on a house and the listing presenting the offer in one hour. Alden said, are you near a computer? Yes, I'm pretty much always near a computer. So I was able to put that together for him and get it signed by his clients so that it could be presented. You know, now that's not something I do often, but once in a while, if I've got an agent that's out in the field and we need a counter offer signed so we can open escrow right now, I'll send that out. You bet, because that benefits both of us, <laughs> you know. It helps um, to be kind. And, and, it helps to be kind to your TC. It helps to not ask your TC for discounts, right? Um, uh, and it helps uh, to uh, be very understanding uh, of your TC. And then also uh, just, um, like, here's the truth. There's so much value in this. Um, I love working with Leslie specifically. Um, but it also helps to be very good. So if you're opening a lot of transactions and if you're doing uh, good stuff, um, then your TC might help you out a little bit more. But if you're just like, you know, hanging out around the hallways and clogging up the toilets, um, then your TC might not help you out so much. But, uh, but uh, so Leslie Hill, um, what else do you have about transaction coordination? And then I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to hop into DISC uh, and see if there's any questions here in the Zoom, um, any questions in on Facebook. And then we'll get into Disc and Myers Briggs. Anything else for me, my friend? So uh, basically, it's just I think it's a good to have a, a team with some uh, experience, um, like repair requests. I have a lot of agents that write those up, and then they'll tell me, "Can you look at it and see?" Well, you know, if you just put on there that you want the air conditioner in working order. Um, you might get uncle that has no AC experience that's in there wrenching on air conditioner and it may work for a cup, you know, until your client gets in and then all of a sudden it's no good. Being in the business so long, I know how to write it up to where it's so tight that you're not only, you know, you, you want the air conditioner in working order fixed by a licensed contractor and the buyer receives all paperwork. That way the buyer gets a copy of that paperwork. You don't put that sentence in there. Your buyer doesn't get a copy of that paperwork because they didn't pay for that service to be done by the air conditioner company. And it could be, you know, Uncle Joe fixing the air conditioner, not even a licensed company. So just the way we word things in our industry is really important. And um, but transaction coordinators are just they come in all different experiences. There are unlicensed coordinators that you can hire. You can hire a coordinator over in another country for about $200. I know a couple, uh, you know, but you basically. Yeah, and so. the truth is, and uh, we're getting some lag here on the internet connection, um, but the truth is, is uh, like you could hire another transaction coordinator um, in another country for $200. Um, just like you could get a lender who works in another state who might be willing to do it for cheap. But I'm telling you, it helps to work with local people. And um, 
we're going to get into this right now because we're going to talk about hiring. Um, and I'm not seeing any additional questions right now in the Zoom chat. Uh, so, and nor on Facebook. So, um, Leslie, what I'm going to do is I'm going to let you go on with your Monday because I know you're extraordinarily busy. Um, how can people reach out to you, my friend? So, uh, cell number text or telephone calls is 951-966-0008. And email is leslie, L-E-S-L-I-E, at assuredtm for transactionmanagement.com. So, leslie at assuredtm.com. Oh, I lost you. It's getting a little laggy here. Um, so my mom said, watching up in the front office, clearly it pays to have a transaction coordinator, not licensed yet, but this is clearly very valuable. Um, okay, what I want to get into is some Myers-Briggs. I want to get into DISC. I want to get into hiring. And so we're going to start having some fun. Here we go. Not that that wasn't fun because it was fun. Okay, I don't want to. Here, let's get this off to the side um, and pop this guy up. We're going to start with uh, hiring and DISC. So your first hire is going to be a TC. And we've talked about that before. In fact, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to bring this down a little bit. There we go. Your first hire is going to be your transaction coordinator. And this is going to be about $500 a file. Um, Per file. Uh, now, your transaction coordinator, the type of uh, my, uh, excuse me, disc personality that you want, is you want an S C type of personality. You do not want an I, and you certainly do not want a D to be your transaction coordinator. Now, your second hire, in my opinion, in a market like this one, should be an administrative assistant. Uh, or an operations manager. Um, now, with an admin, you could typically you typically pay them weekly, um, and this is going to be if you're in a situation to where you really get out the bat fast. Now, I don't think that you should hire. And again, this is an S C personality, and we're going to talk about what S's and C's are, what uh, D's and I's are here in just a moment. And in fact, that might be a, a really helpful place to go next. And, but anyway. A buyer's agent used to be the next logical place to go, but this is actually changing. So it used to be buyer's agent, but now it is a showing assistant. Now, this is going to be somebody who might be a D if they're at the very beginning of their career, but they're not going to stick around very long as um, a showing assistant because they're going to feel underutilized and underpaid. So uh, it's more than likely going to be an I, an S, a D next, and then not really a C either uh, because C's are more, uh, you know, they're, they're clerics. They're people that are really great admins. They're very uh, paperwork focused. They're not necessarily people that you want uh, to be out in the field but there are people that you want to have handling your books. Um, and then the last person that you want to, to hire to replace you is going to be your listing agent. Um, now, this can be a D, but you're going to have to operate, uh, set up a situation where they're being fairly compensated, they feel valuable, they have their appointments being set up for them, they're not having their uh, to handle paperwork, um, a, if you get a listing agent that's a D, you're in a good situation. I is good too, but again, um, D's could be in a situation to where they are going to want to undersuit you. Not a C, not an S. So what do all these different things stand for? D, think of your high driver. So they are drivers. They are dominant. Um, your eyes. Which, of course, you know, Ds make great team leads. Um, I am a 99D. I am an 87I. 
and my S and my C are pretty low. My S is like 20 something and my C is like negative 8,000. I hate paperwork. Um, so your D is drivers, they're dominant. Your I, um, these are your extroverts. These are your people who are people people. Um, so they're extrovert, um, they're talkative. It's probably the, the, the biggest attribute that I would say with an I personality. Now, S personalities are a little bit more introverted. They're very supportive. So that's, they can be extroverts, but they tend to be supportive. They're great support people. Um, they're, they can be um, introverts, which means that they can struggle in um, open house situations. They struggle on the phones, which is why they really make great admins, great operations managers, great um, transaction coordinators, et cetera, and so forth. The C personality, now these often go hand in hand. These can go hand in hand. These typically go hand in hand, but you don't see a lot of this or a lot of this. Um, so these guys are your admins. They are your uh they love paperwork. They love systems and procedures. So um, when you get your disk, your D is your listing agent. That's the last person that you have hired hire to replace you. Your I's are your talking to people. They could talk to somebody for four hours and not get a phone number to follow up with them on or feel bad about asking them for their information. So with your eyes, you need, really need to coach them into believing in what they're selling. Um, with your S personalities, they're great admins, as are your Cs. So up here, your C, S personalities, right here you're going to be your Ds and your I's when you're talking about hiring. Now, let's move over a little bit and let's talk about the Myers-Briggs. So this is DISC. So let's go ahead and let's, let's hop over to... Uh, um, Myers Briggs. Now, there's a couple of different places where you could take both of these assessments. The DISC personality is easy to find, lots of different things out there. But on your Myers Briggs, it's 16 personalities.org. And what's going to happen is you're going to get four letters, take those four letters and plug them into YouTube to get more information on your personality type. I find that DISC is great for hiring and that Myers-Briggs is great for understanding you. Um, in fact, I want to move a light up here really quick because I feel like I'm getting a little bit dark. Yeah, let's see if that helped at all. Okay, so, let's, okay, so your Myers-Briggs is great for understanding you. DISC is great for hiring. We just talked about that a little bit. Um, a great place to take that is 16personalities.org. Now, um, this is what 16 personalities is based off of. E and I, um, N versus S, uh, T versus F, and um, judging versus Perception, P. Okay, so E versus I. This is extroverted versus introverted. What this is, this is you know pretty self-explanatory. I'm not going to spend a whole heck of a lot of time here. That being said, there are certain personality types like the ENTP, which is mine, ENTP, which is the most introverted of all of the extroverted types. Um, so, okay, introverted versus extroverted versus introverted. Now, in is intuitive versus sensing. So intuitive, um, picking up on a lot of like almost like unspoken things versus sensing, which is like, okay, this is the way that things are. Okay, this is, um, I heard this, I saw that, that's what it is, right? Thinking versus feeling. This is a huge one. Now, of course, there are a lot of people who feel uh, very deeply, but they're also thinkers. This is about what you prioritize when making a decision. Are you ultimately going to prioritize your thought or are you gonna prioritize the way that you feel? Okay? Um, 
The big difference between an ENTP and an ENFP. Big difference between an ENTP and an ENFP. And maybe we'll break that down here in just a moment. Now, the last one is judge, judging versus perceiving. Judging is, um, uh, okay, so the, the, the way that judging is, this is uh, you, this is that, these are the systems, uh, you get to work. Perceiving is like, wow, this is the way that everything could be if we all just work together, or if X, Y, and Z. So um, the way of looking at this is that, um, so like, <laughs> there's a great way of, uh, this, is a, this is actually a good, uh, good example. So um, EP, IP, IJ, and EJ. So what these are, these are the, these are the four different, because uh, there's 16, of course, different combinations. Um, extroverted uh, perceiving people are, um, uh, um, what are, actually, you know what, there's this thing that I just wrote up here. And I want to make sure that I get it right. Give me just one moment. Okay, this is, is going to be fun if I can find this really quick because I felt like this is a really accurate way of describing the different personality types in a way that, um, okay, this is fun. Here we go. So EJ is, uh, okay, what I got, EP first. EP, explore, explore new shit. That's e EP. IJ is, let's organize this shit. IPs are, I'm going to do my own shit. And EJs are, let's get shit done. Yeah, I can. So there, here, let me go and pull that down. <clears throat> da, 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 da. Okay. This is beginning to look like my notebook, and everyone's going to think I'm completely nuts again. Uh, that's okay. I think I'm nuts. I'm doing the professor thing. Da, 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 da. Okay. So, again, EPs, extrovert, extroverted perception. Let's explore new shit. IPs, I'm going to do my own shit. IJs, let's organize this shit. And EJs, let's get shit done, right? So, like, you've got your ENT, uh, ENTJ. That would be like uh, Elon Musk is an ENT, ENTJ. Um, they're very much like they're great managers, great, uh, great managers. They're great leaders sometimes when they really can get in the thick of it. Um, but their ENTJs love to make fun of my personality type, which are ENTPs, because ENTPs are the incessant dreamers. Right? We're constantly like, um, we're the debaters. We're the inventors of the Myers-Briggs. And so with an ENTP, you're constantly going to be figuring out new shit, exploring new shit. But it's hard to get shit done if you don't have a J around you. So like for me, <laughs> Stacy Crowley says, I love this shit. Okay, great. <laughs> we're in it together then. Um, so for me, like I said, I am an ENTP. My wife is an ISFJ. We are quite literally the opposites of one another. Um, and so she's got a major left side of her brain and my left side of my brain practically doesn't exist. I'm constantly wanting to organize everybody uh, around. I'm a gatherer of people. She wants to make sure that all of the stray different people aren't being lost. And so um, again, creator, organizer. Right, And those two different types do really great things together. So what you want to do is you always want to hire to accommodate your weaknesses, right? Or hire to accommodate your deficiencies. So one of the, the first things that I suggest that you do, go to 16personalities.org. And I'm going to put that um, in here right into the chat. 16personalities.org. And what that will do is that will give you an opportunity to figure out how you are designed, um, which is a lot of fun. It's a great place to start, right? 
a lot of people uh, don't figure themselves out. And so they're constantly trying to fight these uphill battles by going against the way that they're designed. If you're not naturally wired for uh, um, a position where you want to lead, um, don't push yourself in a situation where you're uncomfortable. Let me go ahead and uh, pull up the Zoom. Let me, okay. This looks like a horrible math problem. Ah, Michelle, how dare you? No, oh, it's a, it's a, um, <laughs> that's funny. Ah, oh, it's funny. Ha ha ha, Michelle. Ha ha ha. <laughs> I know where you live, Michelle. I know where you live. No, I'm just that's kidding. Real. It looks so, like a stats problem, though, really. It's like, it really, equals no, you're absolutely right. So, <laughs> so I like to, I used to have a podcast and we would talk about how it's hacking the algorithms of life, right? Um, because really, when it comes down to creating a team, when it comes down to like, um, you know, organizing a squad, different people are organized differently. I used to think in the beginning of my career that, you know, you could force everyone to just be exactly the same and that everybody could figure out a tax rate um, in their head and calculate monthly payments in their head and could memorize all the different neighborhoods. But like, I also assume Anyway, I assumed a lot of different things about a lot of different people, but the, tr the worst thing that you could do is coach a bunch of people into being you as a team leader, right? Instead, you want to find people that are going to be uh, totally different than you are. Um, and then, so like, for example, for example, let's get into this a little bit. Let's make this crazy math problem a little bit more insane, shall we? So like, when you have an ENTP versus an ENFP, what happens is the ENFP, which is uh, Jamie B, it's my mom, it's Andrew Herringer, it's my grandma, it's a, uh, my cousin Bridget. So like if, if you haven't noticed, I like to have everybody in my life take a Myers-Briggs personality test to decide whether or not I'm going to fuck with them at all. <laughs> and if they're no good, and if they're no good with the Myers-Briggs, then I'm like, oh, listen, ooh, I'm not necessarily sure that we're going to jive. No, I'm just kidding. No, but I'm dead serious. So, like, uh, Myers-Briggs is really important. So, uh, the ENFP, these, uh, e the ENFP, they are absolutely fantastic buyer's agents. They hate to be front and center. They don't necessarily love to be celebrated. They don't love to get awards, uh, you know, out, uh, you know, and have a stage and a microphone, but they like to give back. They're campaigners, right? So, if they believe in something, um, they're you know, a lot of them will, will go down with the ship for people that they love, right? Now, that being said, with the campaigner, they could also switch. If they don't believe in it, it's impossible to get them to do anything, right? If they believe in it, there's nothing that can stop them from doing it. So with an ENFP, the truth is coaching them how to understand their product and believe in their product and believe in themselves in a way that they feel comfortable not selling themselves but supporting their clients, right? And that's what makes them really great buyer's agents. Um, an ENFP can, of course, be a, a great listing agent um, and a great solo agent. Uh, you know, the ENFPs uh, that they tend to struggle a little bit as team leads because they, uh, they like to campaign for something. They like to be a part of a team. Um, they don't necessarily love the criticism that comes with being out in front. So, like, and all of that comes from the difference between a T and a P. Now, an ENTP... They're constantly coming up with new ideas. They're great rainmakers, but they're terrible at staying organized. So um, they're sort of like the uh, distracted dog of the Myers Briggs. They're like squirrel, squirrel. So it's like new idea. You know what I mean? It's like finish your current idea before you get to your new idea. And so um, coaching an ENTP into productivity, you really they have to have ownership over something that they that they're a part of. Um, they tend to be D's a lot of times and that they're very dominant um, in that they are not campaigners, but they are, um, uh, they can be uh, debaters, antagonistic almost, of, uh, of people at the front. And if you can take their criticism with understanding that they're doing it to make you better and not always just to challenge you, although sometimes that happens too, then you can really get a lot out of having a healthy working relationship with the ENTP. If you uh, are an ENTJ or even an INTJ, uh, great team leads. ESFJs, um, e, uh, ENFJs, also um, 
because they could, you know, ESFJs can be the bros of the Myers Briggs. So they they really they like to have like that hustle entrepreneurship type mentality. But past that, um, they've got to have something more going on. Otherwise, people will get lost in that sort of a environment because not everyone wants to hustle until they die. So anyway, I'm getting way off into the woods, and I feel like it's probably important to remember why we started this here really quick. We talked about Myers Briggs honoring your design. Okay, so actually, I didn't get that off in the woods. We really covered some really good stuff. So right now, I want to check to see if anybody has any questions because that's the five-minute warning for class. Um, Myers Briggs, great for understanding you. DISC, great for understanding a potential teammate. Myers Briggs is more, it's more highbrow in as far as I'm concerned than DISC. I feel like DISC is like here are the four shapes. And this is the best way to fit them into the four holes. Whereas Myers-Briggs is like, it really teaches you how to understand people and team atmosphere um, and environment and culture and then build it, right? So if I was going to hire an elite squad of operators, I would absolutely be looking at Myers-Briggs, not just this. So let me, that looks like a horrible math problem. Oh, I got to one question in the Zoom and then I got way off into the woods and creating more horrible math problems. All right. Your screen information is blocking your writing. Took care of that. Thank you, Amy. Um, really, hmm, I don't know how to fix that specifically, Michelle. All right. Uh, can you remove the topics from the screen? Yes, thanks. Oh, wait. You're talking to Dave. Um, oh, <laughs> okay. And I guess I, I never get these chats live, and so because I've got so much going on. Um, okay. This personality, uh, we talked about that. Uh, Felicia Harris. Is this, is this this is Mary Kay Felicia, right? Okay. Felicia's coming in to be a part of the news here. We'll see you shortly. Um, she's got you covered from your lips to your hips and your eyes to your thighs. She's like, and, and like a million other things. It's such a great pitch. Um, good morning to you, Tom. Uh, oh, I wanted you guys to be able to find the 16 personalities um, information out there. So the first half of the class ended up being completely different than the second half of the class. Just kind of the idea here. Let's see. Anything else from anybody else? Okay. If not, then we'll kill it, guys. We'll go ahead and we'll move on. Strongly encourage you guys to uh, take your DISC assessment. Um, take your Myers-Briggs. Um, figure out how you are designed. Um, and then take those four little letters that you're going to get from your Myers-Briggs and then plug them into YouTube. So if you get like ENTP or ESFJ or whatever, plug that into YouTube. YouTube will come back with a list of videos that you can watch. One of them will be by IDR Labs. And IDR Labs will give you a great breakdown of your personality in like four to five minutes. And you'll be like, I thought I was so unique. And then it turns out we're not so unique. We're all just a part of a very complicated math problem. <laughs> All right, anything else, guys? Um, do you take these classes during the weekends? Is this like seven days a week, or is it just Monday through Friday? Um, the classes that I'm teaching? Yeah. Um, I teach them Monday through Friday, uh, 9 to 10 o'clock on Facebook. Okay. And then I teach them for high school students from 4 to 5 o'clock. Um, yeah. Did you want access to me uh, on the I weekends? Heck no. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, no, that was too much. No. <laughs> so you don't have to uh, to be a part of all these classes. You don't have to attend all of them in order to get your, you know, your certificates and your licenses and whatnot. Um, it, this is just sort of like extra information. Um, really, you can get signed up with First Tuesday with CalPaces and then set an alarm for 18 days from now and then like set it and forget it. And then take your test. It's open book. Do the same thing for day 36 and for day 54, and then uh, you'll really be in a situation to where then you can mail off, and you don't have to wait and take a 15-week course when you can condense everything into significantly shorter period of time. Good to know. I think this is still probably good information, though, coming into it, like, you know, total career switch, so. Yeah, what we're doing is on Mondays, we're really trying to give people a little bit more uh a little bit more to bite off, right? So like, so that when you walk in on day one, you feel really comfortable to start a career in real estate. 
and then even before then while you're generating leads and then uh, and then of course with um, day with Tuesday through Thursday we're touching a little bit more of like the 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 curriculum, what I feel like is important that I want to touch on from the books. And then Fridays, we get into these Socratic discussions where we're talking a little bit more objectively about our businesses. Cool. cool. Well, thank you. That's very cool. You got it, my friends. Everybody have a good rest of your day. Let me know if you guys need anything or if you guys have any questions about today's lesson. My cell phone number is there at the bottom of the screen. Have a good day, Facebook, and have a good day, Zoom. Bye, guys.